Uh, right. Okay. So motions. Um, this is the third uh, the third stage on our conventional civil action. Uh, this long road to justice that's going to preoccupy us for the first half of this course. Uh, and uh, the game plan today is I'm going to talk first about motions generally. I'm going to introduce this motions family tree, which is kind of the view from uh, 50,000 feet of all the different types of motions that, uh, that we're going to be learning about. And then we're going to talk about a couple of cases in detail, the first being the Gomeshi versus CBC case, um, and we will use them to illustrate a couple of important points about motions. And uh, then we'll get to the RJR case, RJR McDonald, which is a, uh, a beast of a case, not an easy read. Lots of big ideas there, um, but we're going to use it uh, both to illustrate how constitutional law considerations work in civil procedure, but more importantly, the test for these interlocutory uh, injunctions. Okay, so motions. Motions are, um, a motion is uh, defined as a request for a judicial decision other than through trial or an appeal. So anytime you're asking a judge to give you something or to make a certain order and you're not trying to do that through the mechanism of a trial or appeal, what you are doing is bringing a motion. So motions are by far the most common form of civil uh, courtroom advocacy. If you pursue a career as a civil litigator, you will uh, probably do 50 motions before you do a single trial in your career. And you'll do 100 motions before you ever argue an appeal. So it's, uh, it's what brings people into court uh, most often by a long shot when they're, when they're civil litigators. So, uh, so here is our motions family tree, which I'm going to go through, uh, go through bit by bit to try to um, give you kind of a taxonomy of where all the different types of motions fit in. So the first, uh, the first distinction you need to know is between procedural and substantive motions. Uh, a procedural motion is simply about how the litigation should proceed. Right, so uh, th this is about what should happen next. We know there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of things can happen in a lot of different ways, even within the context of conventional civil action. And procedural motions are about how something should happen in the context of litigation itself. Can anyone give us an example of a procedural motion that we've seen uh, thus far in this course? Motion for particulars. Yes, we have seen a motion for particulars. Uh, what uh, what case do we see that motion for particulars in? Nancy Gay Rothstein. Yes, that's one of them. And also Copeland versus Commodore. Right. So so these are people we've seen already in this course uh, bringing procedural motions. Right, where they are not arguing about anything in the real world or about anything that they cared about before they got into civil litigation, but rather about something within the case itself, right? And with particulars, uh, it's all about trying to get extra data from the other side about, uh, about something they've claimed in their, in their pleadings. Okay, so we saw that in, uh, in, in Rothstein and Copeland. Um, let's see, people mentioned um, the, yeah, some, so, uh, Horton versus Martosh, uh, and in that case, um, yeah, there was a motion for an order set, setting aside a default judgment, um, uh, which may be more on the substantive side, but also we saw that Martosh, uh, the poor chap who was defamed by Horton, uh, had to bring a motion for substituted service, right? He had to go to court to get permission to use some other mechanism to deliver this statement of claim, uh, because Horton was uh, was evading personal service. Okay, so that's our those are our examples of procedural motion. Then we have a substantive motion. Substantive motion are about the real world. They're about the substantive dispute that the parties had before they got involved in civil litigation. Okay, so let's go down uh, one level further and divide our procedural motions into 
um, motions on notice and motions without notice. So notice simply means that the other side is, or, or the other parties are notified of the fact that you are bringing a motion. You will be asking a judge to, uh, to grant you something. Can anyone uh, remind us what is that, uh, that Latin phrase that um, is the reason why motions must typically be brought on notice? There we go. Everyone says audial terum partum. Exactly right. We've got to hear both sides, and you can't hear both sides unless both sides and all sides, in fact, know that a decision is going to be made. Okay, so we'll see that 99% um, that of procedural motions brought, are brought on notice, but there are exceptional circumstances that we'll look at a little bit later, which can justify bringing a motion without notice. All right, um, so moving down the line, Okay, so uh, so we're talking now about a substantive motions, right? And uh, and one category of substantive motion is disposition without trial. So a substantive motion uh, for for disposition without trial is a, a motion that will end the case. If you win a motion for disposition without trial, then you are. Um, you win completely for your client. Disposition means the case is over, uh, and, uh, and 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 that's you know generally considered the best result you can possibly get for uh, for a client in in civil litigation. And um, we're going to have a whole um, a whole unit on disposition without trial after we get through this uh, section number nine in the course will be about all the different forms of disposition without trial uh, that we have in our system. And then we have interlocutory substantive motions, right? So here we're talking about the real world. It's an order that affects the real world rights of a party, but does not dispose of the matter. So interlocutory means that, uh, that it's for the time being. It's um, until the matter can be finally disposed of, typically through trial. Uh, and then we get um, down to our different types of interlocutory motion. Uh, so first we have money remedy motions, right, where um, the court is going to order that someone pay money to someone, um, someone else on, a, on an interim basis or an interlocutory basis. Uh, and then we have injunctions. So usually it's, it's a court order that someone stop doing something. Occasionally, an injunction will be in order to positively do something, uh, but 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 usually you're right. It's uh, it's to it's to stop doing something. Okay, so uh, moving down one level further, we have um, again the distinction between notice and without notice. Just as on the procedural side, uh, you can uh, an interlocutory motion can, in certain exceptional circumstances, be brought without. Uh, without notice. Okay, so uh, so this is kind of our, our high level view. I'm sure the details seem a bit confusing at the moment, but we're going to look through a couple cases that will hopefully illustrate uh, what some of these uh, things are all about. So the first uh, the first case we're going to look at is uh, Gian Gomeshi. Um, so people. Uh, hopefully still remember what uh, the Gian Gomeshi saga was all about. It's now four or five years ago. Um, but uh, uh, Gomeshi was a rock musician um, who eventually became a, uh, a radio host on the CBC. He was one of the best known and highest paid uh, personalities on the CBC. Um, can anyone remind us uh, how he got in trouble and why his, uh, his time at the CBC came to an end? allegations of sexual misconduct, both uh, in the workplace as well as allegations of sexual assault um, out, uh, outside of the CBC workplace. Um, so he was charged with sexual assault. Uh, he lost his job at the CBC. Uh, he was eventually acquitted on, um, on the sexual assault charges, uh, but he acknowledged um, uh, sexually inappropriate conduct in the workplace and uh, apologized to, uh, to one of the complainants over that. So Gomeshi was, was best known as a criminal case, but before it was a criminal case, it was actually a civil case, very briefly. 
uh, a civil lawsuit in which Gomeshi was the plaintiff. Okay, so how did this come about? Well, uh, in the middle of October 2014, uh, these allegations of, uh, of sexual assault against Gomeshi became public, uh, and um, they were first published in the Toronto Star. And after that happened, the CBC announced uh, quite quickly that they were going to fire him. So uh, October 26, 2014, uh, CBC is saddened to announce its relationship with Gomeshi has come to an end. Um, uh, he's made an immense contribution, etc. And uh, their spokesperson added that information came to our attention recently that in our in CBC's judgment precludes us from continuing our relationship with uh, with Gian Gomeshi. Okay, so that's October 26. The very next day, uh, this document was filed uh, at uh, the courthouse at 393 University. Um, so you'll see there the, uh, the date. It was uh, October October 27th, right there. So, uh, so Gameshi here is the plaintiff. He's brought this lawsuit. He's not suing the complainants. He's suing the CBC, um, his, uh, his former employer. And he claims in this statement of claim that uh, the CBC uh, misused personal and confidential information provided to it in confidence and under common interest privilege for the CBC's own purposes and to the detriment of Mr. Gomeshi, uh, which is quite a mouthful, but we'll try to uh, see what he's getting at here. Uh, so it's a, it's, he claims this tort of um, breach of confidence uh, as well as defamation. So uh, it's in some ways a lot like other statements of claim we've seen so far. Um, it goes through, uh, as at the beginning here, um, his biography, the first six paragraphs are all the wonderful things he's done for the CBC, the people he's interviewed, how popular his show was. Uh, then uh, at paragraph seven, he says that although these allegations have been brought against him, um, they're completely false. Uh, however, again, he's not suing the complainants, he's not suing the women who complained against him. Um, he says, so what has he got against the CBC? Well, here at paragraph 11, he says that uh, he told the CBC his side of the story, right? Basically, he had a private meeting with his, with his managers at the CBC and said, um, look, I was into some kind of kinky, edgy stuff, uh, bedroom-wise, but uh, it was all completely consensual, he says. And then paragraph 17, he suggests that uh, the CBC told him that they were satisfied that the allegations of lack of consent were false. Right? So he says, the CBC lured me into complacency. They, they said, yeah, we're totally with you. We buy it. We don't believe it. Uh, and then he, um, in reliance on that, paragraph 18, uh, showed them, uh, to share with the CBC certain materials exchanged between himself uh, and the woman believed to be behind the allegations to demonstrate conclusively that the relationship they had was purely a consensual one. So this is some videos and some text messages um, that, that, in his view, established the consensual nature of everything that went on. Um, and then if you go down to paragraph 32, he says um, um, he never would have shared these materials with the CBC if they had not led him to believe that they were completely on his side and that they were gonna, they were gonna back him up. Um, and then the CBC, in fact, took these materials that he showed them in, in reliance on that and used it as a pretext to fire him. Okay, so, uh, so that's his basic story. Let's uh, look at a few, few more details here. Uh, we have the summary of damages up here at the top. These are big round numbers. Um, you know, throwing in some punitive damages in there. Um, many of the same specific forms of remedy are, uh, are, are, are sought, the pre-judgment and post-judgment interest uh, and costs and so on. We also said when we were talking about pleadings that pleadings are not just rule following, they're also uh, narrative advocacy. The pleading is an opportunity to tell your client's story uh, and, and hopefully 
use that persuasive opportunity to bring the audience uh, around to your client's view of the facts and the law. So the story that he's telling here, kind of between the lines, is basically that uh, the CBC are, uh, you know, they're old fashioned prudes. Um, and uh, you see the paragraph right here at the top. Uh, there's no place for the state and the bedrooms of the nation, this uh, famous quote from um, our first Trudeau prime minister. Um, and then uh, he, he, he goes on in paragraph 21. He says, uh, the, CDC were, uh, the CDC was making a moral judgment about the appropriateness of this BDM, BDSM stuff he was doing, which again, he says was, was consensual. Uh, uh, paragraph 23, he says uh, the, the CBC has an antiquated perspective. Uh, so this is all um, this is all part of his narrative advocacy, part of the story that he's trying to tell with his pleading, right? Um, uh, you know, this the story of uh, that, that you led me to believe we were in this together, and you were going to back me up, and then you turned and stabbed me in the back and fired me. Um, uh, and secondly, that. You know, basically, I'm the coolest thing about the CBC, but, you know, these executives are a bunch of, uh, of, of old prudes who still think this has a place in the bedrooms of the nation, and they're firing me because because they can't stomach this, this kinky but completely consensual stuff uh, that I was into. Okay, so this uh, was filed the day after he was fired, as I said, and it basically went over like a load of bricks. Uh, so um, Howard Levitt, a uh, famous Canadian employment lawyer, says this is, has nothing, everything to do with strategy and PR and nothing to do with legal entitlement. Um, and this other guy said that um, it was more of a publicity stunt than a serious legal challenge. Okay, so uh, so so basically, the, pe the problem pe people were upset about this because, first of all, because it seemed to be um, uh, an unmeritorious lawsuit, lack of a, a legal leg to stand on, for reasons that we'll see, but also because of uh, of this lawsuit, the statement of claim was seen to have crossed the line uh, into one which is excessively PR oriented and and insufficiently legally grounded. Right. This in particular rubbed a lot of lawyers the wrong way. You should just just never do this. Don't ever put a quote uh, at the top of a statement of claim. Um, and a lot of this language was also uh, thought to be completely inappropriate. The stuff about uh, the antiquated perspective, this kind of colorful, uh, this kind of colorful language. OK, so um, the CBC. Um, as you know, they're now a defendant in this lawsuit. They could have issued a statement of defense and had the civil action proceed in its normal way. Uh, they didn't do that. Instead, they brought this motion. Uh, so this is a motion to, uh, to strike out Gomeshi's pleadings. So a motion to strike is a, is, is, is a way to, um, to, to respond to a statement of claim as it's an alternative to to bringing a statement of defense um, and we'll talk about motions to strike in more detail uh, next month but 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 this is here at this point in the course to kind of illustrate um, how uh, how these motion rules and uh, and the provisions we have about the structure of a motion um, play out when you actually see them on uh, on paper um, okay, so let's just look at this uh, as, as a matter of uh, the formal rules here, right? So in your readings, you have um, Rule 37, um, Rule 37.01, a motion shall be made by a notice of motion. Um, and um, so you see that's what this form looks like, a motion, motion record. Um, it's different from the pleadings you've seen so far. You've got this, uh, this record with the names of the lawyers on the front. Um, and then uh, an index, sort of showing everything that's, uh, that's included in that motion record. Uh, next rule, the notice of motion shall be served on any party or other person who will be affected by the order sought unless these rules provide otherwise. So uh, what, kind of, what kind of service would, uh, 
would occur with a motion record. Okay, I'm going to show the responses. So uh, 20 say no, and that's correct. This uh, is not one of the documents that would require uh, personal service. And that's because this is not an originating process, right? This is a document going between, which, which is being served upon someone who already knows they're involved in litigation because he started the litigation. Uh, therefore, personal service would not be required. Okay, so um, 37.10 says that uh, you have to serve a motion record. Uh, and that's uh, that's what this is. Uh, you see, it's, um, it uses that uh, the notice of motion is, is the first part of it, and the motion record includes these uh, these exhibits as well. Uh, Thirty-seven point ten talks about um, about what specifically has to be in this motion record. So the table of contents is there, the notice of motion. A copy of all affidavits and other materials served by any party for use on the motion. Uh, and, uh, and you'll see that in there as well. So, uh, so, so basically, in a motion record, you have to uh, say what you want, um, why you think you're entitled to it, and also, importantly, attach the evidence which supports that claim. Right, so this is a key point of contrast between a motion record and a pleading. Right, pleadings never include evidence; motion records do. Okay, so just uh, if people have had a chance to kind of kind of look at this, can anyone give us a sense of why the CBC um, thinks that Jiang Gameshi's statement of claim is so wrong that? Uh, that it's not even worth responding to substantively and should in fact just be struck right off the bat. Can anyone tell us that uh, orally? Why, um, why, uh, what the thrust of the CBC's motion is here? What are they getting at in this, uh, this motion record? Is it about what Gomeshi did or, or didn't do when and whether there was consent to the things he did. So, so collective agreements, as people may or may not know, depending on whether you've taken employment law, uh, a collective agreement is a contract between, on the one hand, an employer, and on the other hand, all of the employees of, of that employer, or at least all of the employees in a certain category. So the CBC is a unionized workplace uh, where the, the union has signed a collective agreement on behalf of the employees with, with the CBC. And collective agreements, uh, one of the things they do, in addition to establishing wages and benefits and so on, is establish uh, dispute resolution procedures so that if disputes of any type arise regarding things that happen in the workplace, um, everyone stays out of court and you have a, uh, an arbitration process instead. That's that's the thrust of this motion, right? Is that uh, you know w whether whether or not this was consensual um, is uh, it, the the point is that um, suing he has no right whatsoever to sue over this stuff because it's properly subject to the collective agreement and to uh, to the arbitration process. They deny that the state their statement of firing him was defamatory um, as as well. Okay, so, uh, so they strike back with this within a week of, of getting the statement of claim. Um, the outcome of this uh, case was, uh, was reached very quickly thereafter. Uh, on uh, November 25th, uh, Gomeshi withdrew his suit, so he completely abandons his lawsuit against the CBC, and he agrees to pay $18,000 in legal costs um, to compensate the CBC for their legal costs. So, uh, so this lawsuit was a total disaster. His lawyers probably wish they'd never taken it on, um, or at least they probably wish they'd uh, waited for a bit of sober second thought instead of trying to file the statement of claim uh, the very day after he was fired. Why do you think? Uh, why do you think they might have been tempted, or why why were they tempted to file this lawsuit uh, the day after he was fired? Clearly, it was it was a rush job, and uh, a very costly mistake. Why was this Why was this strategy perhaps appealing? Yeah, yeah, I think people are getting at it. It has to do with the media narrative, 
right? Uh, it, was, it was thought to be a way to, uh, to define the story in the media on Gomeshi's terms, right? Instead of this being a story about how he did this shady non-consensual stuff and got fired for it, the story they're trying to, to create is one of the CBC um, has, you know, can't deal with how cool I am and, and you know, they've, they've fired from me for no reason after luring me into showing them my, my consensual sex tapes. So that's, uh, that, that's what, uh, was what they were probably getting at. Um, okay, so uh, I, this did not go well. Um, and it raised, uh, at the time, um, an interesting uh, ethical question around the, um, the, the rules of, uh, of professional conduct for lawyers and how they, uh, how they apply to lawsuits which are perhaps legally uh, suspect, legally questionable. Um, so uh, our own Professor Tanovich, right? So, um, so this was, uh, this was his, uh, his thought on this. Um, that uh, uh, there's serious systemic problems in our justice system surrounding the treatment of sexual assault complainants, like the people who complained about Gameshi, this culture of intimidation, denial, and blaming, uh, and, and under-reporting of, of sexual assault. And um, this case, uh, 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 Professor Tanovich said, might be another example of the complicity of lawyers in the silencing of sexual assault claimants. Um, and if so, it may not be ethical for lawyers to follow the instructions of a client to accomplish that purpose. Uh, because the lawyers owe duties not only to their clients, but also to the profession and to the public, and are obliged to ensure their conduct does not bring the administration of justice into disrepute. So, uh, and he suggests that the purpose of this lawsuit might have been to silence the complainants. So, the interesting thing about this argument is that the lawsuit, of course, is not against the complaints. The lawsuit is against the CBC. So, so in, in what way might a lawsuit against, you know, not filed directly against complainants, nonetheless have the effect of silencing complainants or, or be perceived as part of a strategy to, to do so? It can, it can uh, cause them to back down if they seem to be losing, if the, the media story seems to be changing. It can also deter the defendant, deter the CBC from acting further um, on, on behalf of the complainants um, or for, for taking further action um, on, on their behalf. Because of course, some of the complainants were themselves employees of the CBC and, and, and uh, basically uh, underlings of, uh, of, of Gomeshi on his show. Okay, so Tanovich is calling out not just uh, Gomeshi himself, but also the lawyers who actually who actually brought this lawsuit. Uh, and um, he refers to this rule of professional conduct, uh, that lawyers are forbidden to abuse the process of any tribunal by instituting or prosecuting proceedings, which, although legal in themselves, are clearly motivated by malice on the part of the client and are brought solely for the purpose of injuring the other party. So it's a principle in legal ethics that lawyers are not to be tools of clients who are trying to pursue um, extra legal vendettas or, uh, or, or malicious motives through, through abusive legal process, which lacks, um, lacks merit in of itself. Okay, so that's his view. Um, then the, uh, the doyen of Canadian uh, legal ethicist, Professor Alice Woolley, uh, took uh, a different view on this. She says that legal ethics rules like Rule 5.1-2 ought not to preclude a lawyer from filing such a suit if his client insists upon doing so because a, the lawyer's most fundamental obligation to a client is ensuring that the client's story is told before legal consequences are visited upon her, upon, upon the client. And that is the case even if the client's story is implausible uh, and her case is legally weak. Further, inherent in the structure of the rule of law is permitting those to whom the law applies to engage with the law's application, to argue about its requirements, and to participate in its application. Um, so, so this would be the idea that you know 
Gomeshi has the right to use the civil justice system and his own lawyers should not be silencing him or, uh, or, or stopping him from doing so. Uh, and if the lawsuit is frivolous and vexatious, uh, then the legal system has ways of dealing with it. And that's exactly what happened here, right? The case, once the CBC brought the motion, uh, Gomeshi's team realized they didn't have a leg to stand on and it quickly would have been adjudicated against them. So they gave up and paid costs to the CBC. So Woolley asks why lawyers should, be, should need to impose an additional barrier uh, in respect of their own clients. So, so this uh, was kind of an interesting controversy. Um, so uh, let's get back to the fun stuff, uh, Rule 37 and, uh, and uh, Rule 39. Uh, okay, so uh, responding party's motion records, um, uh, that's basically the same thing, but, but what would come back the other way. Uh, in this particular case, there was no, excuse me, responding party motion record because um, Gomeshi, uh, Gomeshi's team, once they got this, realized that they were going to be blown out of the water. So they just, uh, just gave up and uh, it would claim plus uh, and pay the cost as well. Uh, okay, so affidavits. The um, Rule 39 says that um, evidence on motions is usually by, uh, by affidavit, uh, unless there's another source of law that says otherwise. So what is an affidavit? Uh, an affidavit is explained by Rule 4.06. Uh, and um, an affidavit is, is, effect, is essentially a written statement um, of evidence. So it's a form of evidence where someone tells their story um, in writing and affidavits are always uh, supported by an oath. So you have to swear an affidavit. You can't just write it, you have to swear that it's, uh, that it's true. Um, uh, you will see uh, an example of an affidavit here in the CBC's motion record. Um, so it's right listed in the in the index um, item number two, uh, following the uh, the notice of motion. Okay, so affidavit of Ron Willett. Uh, Ron Willett is um, an executive in the CBC, vice president of uh, labor relations, I think. And uh, and you see here in his affidavit, he basically tells the story, right? So I um, you say where you come from, your 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 residence, and you make oath and say, you say who you are, you say how you know about um, the matters to which you depose. Um, and then you tell the story as uh, from your point of view. So this is a, a person, um, uh, it's, it's all facts, right? There's no argument in an affidavit because it's evidence. The best affidavits come from um, people who have personal knowledge of the matters that are in dispute. Uh, and um, we'll get to the other type of affidavit in a second, but this is an example of the kind of affidavit you, you want to have as evidence if possible, right? Someone who is, has direct personal knowledge of, uh, of the, the, the subject matter of the dispute. Um, and an affidavit, uh, here you see at the end, is the, you, you swear it, so he has to uh, sign it. And, um, and, and swear to its truth before um, a commissioner of oaths. So, uh, so, so that means that uh, this person, Sapna Thacker, um, who is an Arthling student, right, a student at law, went from um, the lawyers, the, from the law firm over to the CVC. Um, they would have had a, a written version of this affidavit, would have been printed out. Um, Ron would have been there with Sapna, and Sapna would say, would say do, you, do you swear this to be true? Ron would say, I, I, I do so swear. He signs it, and Sapna signs it too uh, to, uh, to attest to the fact that Ron has, has sworn that this is true. So it's, you know, some extra procedure, right? Uh, it's not free, just like uh, personal service of affidavits. This is something you have to pay Sapna to do it. Ron has to take time out of his day to do this. Uh, but the idea is that this swearing process increases the um, likelihood that it's true and makes it less likely that Ron is lying. Okay, 
So uh, going back to rule 4.06, um, it says that, um, okay, sorry, rule 39, I meant to say, rule 39.01 uh, sub 4. An affidavit for use on a motion may contain statements of the deponent's information and belief if the source of the information and the fact of the belief are specified in the affidavit. So here we're talking about, there's, there's two categories of, of affidavit. There's the personal knowledge affidavit, and then there's the affidavit on information and belief. So the personal knowledge affidavit is the gold standard, the best kind. That's where you have seen or participated in what you are, what your affidavit is about. You've actually been there, seen it, or done it, or had the conversation. <coughs> An affidavit on information or belief is where that's not the case, where you've been told something or you believe something to be true. So in, in, evident, in terms of evidence, why would an affidavit on information and belief be only second best? Why is it not as good as a personal knowledge affidavit? Yes, yes, exactly right. So an affidavit on information and belief is technically hearsay because it's something that you did not uh, see uh, or, or participate in, in directly. Um, okay, so that doesn't mean it's not allowed, it just, but it does mean that it's second best um, as, um, as Rule 39 uh, sort of implies here, right? So we're going to let this in, but you have to say how you know it um, and, and, and why, why you believe it to be true. Okay, so um, Ron's affidavit, you'll see it's, uh, it's in the first person. Right, so he says who he uses like the, the pronoun I throughout. An affidavit will often be written by a lawyer, so this will probably be part of your job if you're involved in civil litigation as a lawyer to, to write affidavits that people will swear. But uh, you have to prepare an affidavit in close consultation with the person who's going to swear it because it's their evidence. Um, they cannot it cannot be false uh, because they're swearing it to be true, and also. Um, you can, you can be cross-examined on your affidavit, right? So cross-examination, we'll see when we get to discovery, is the process whereby you are questioned uh, by an adverse party or their lawyer. And the, the purpose of cross-examination is to expose uh, falsehoods or contradictions in your evidence, right? So as soon as someone uh, like Ron here agrees to swear an affidavit, they are exposing themselves to the right of their adversary to cross-examine them, to get them in a room or on the stand and say, uh, uh, Mr. Willette, you swore that you um, were, uh, were you know, director of industrial relations, but it says here in your employment record that you no longer had that position of director of industrial relations by November 5th, 2014. Um, and then, you know, Ron will uh, look like an idiot and will be kind of exposed as having sworn something false and is less likely to be taken seriously going forward. So it's the sworn evidence of the affiant. Affiant is the word we use for a person who swears an affidavit. So even though it's probably prepared by their lawyer, you need to be very careful when you're preparing it that it's all true and it's all things that the affiant can honestly swear to. So it's organized uh, in, um, uh, in paragraphs. It's different from, from, from pleadings in that it has this evidence in it. Uh, and um, you have um, also um, an exhibit, right? So the reason why this is 421 pages long is because the entire collective agreement between the CBC and its union is here. Right, and the point of this, well, well why, why is this here? Why is this uh, collective agreement reproduced in as, as an exhibit to this particular motion? Right, because this is the, the evidence of their, the, their, their motion, the thrust of their motion, which is that Gameshi cannot sue in court about this because it's all subject to the collective agreement. Uh, and then you'll see something like this whenever there's uh, an exhibit, right? You have to, 
um, uh, Sapna has to um, swear that this exhibit is, Ron has actually put forward this exhibit um, as part of his affidavit. Okay, so uh, one other rule I wanted to show you about this uh, is this one. Um, this is a rule of professional conduct, uh, which says that if you are the lawyer on a case, you cannot submit your own affidavit before the tribunal, right? So, so, so sometimes um, you'll need to bring a motion and you'll need to use an affidavit to back it up. Um, and it'll be about something that you know uh, to be true, right? So, so particularly with, uh, with a procedural motion, right? You remember that what, often with these procedural motions, prejudice is very much an issue. Prejudice being unfair disadvantage suffered by your client. So often you'll be saying, well, you know, we should get an order for costs or we should um, have the right to an adjournment because something the other side has done has caused prejudice to my client. And you, the lawyer, are the one who knows that. So your first instinct will be, I'm going to swear an affidavit to, to that fact. But that's when you need to remember uh, the rule of professional conduct 5.2-1 that says you cannot do so, typically. Um, and, and the reason for that is that uh, a lawyer is an officer of the court and is supposed to be, um, if you're playing the role of an advocate, you are not supposed to simultaneously be the source of the evidence that you are arguing about. Uh, so, uh, so often, you know, in cases like this, where there really is no client or no representative of a client who can swear that affidavit, uh, you, uh, you'll, you'll sometimes get another lawyer in your firm to swear the affidavit or a secretary or, or a clerk. And even though that affidavit will then be hearsay and therefore less persuasive, um, it, it, it lets you argue the rule. Uh, so that's kind of, by the way, it's sort of an obscure point, but, I, but I, I just did want to flag it because it's something that gets lawyers in trouble sometimes, that uh, it's, it's an idea of legal ethics that, that we as advocates are not the source of, cannot be the source of the evidence that we are using in making our, our submissions before the court. Okay, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll move on and talk about uh, rule 40, which explains uh, interlocutory injunctions. So uh, an interlocutory injunction, you remember, is part of our uh, motions family tree. So this is where the motion is about something substantive, uh, something that affects the real world. You're asking a judge to make an order about the real world. But you're not asking the judge to end the case, to dispose of the case. You're asking for, uh, for an order which will be um, for the time being. Right. So uh, so in an ideal world, right, if you're just sort of imagining what how civil disputes might be resolved on some beautiful paradise desert island where there's no delay and no costs, uh, we might say that our substantive decisions should be made entirely at trial. Right. Because trial is where the truth is most likely to come out. At trial, the parties can lead as much evidence as they want. Uh, and you have a jury to help make the right decisions, and you have opening statements, and, and everything is fully aired at a trial. So in a beautiful paradise, we might say, let's just, if we're going to have motions, they should just be with procedural stuff, and we should make all of our substantive decisions at trial. But the problem is that it takes forever <laughs> to have a trial, right? We know already that this road is very, very long. It's an average of two years pass between the filing of an initial statement of claim and a trial which adjudicates on that civil dispute. So if parties had to wait uh, two years before they got any type of substantive relief, then the civil justice system would be useless for many people, right? Because you just, you, you can't wait that long. Um, so it's, it's the length of the road and, and the length of time that it takes to get to trial, 
which necessitates these substantive uh, and interlocutory motions. Uh, so interlocutory um, means not final. Interlocutory means for the time being. Uh, it's, it's an order which is made to stand only until a court can make that final decision with the benefit of all the facts and all the submissions and then the full scrutiny of, of the evidence. So, uh, so interlocutory uh, or interim relief um, is sought in all sorts of cases. Okay, so uh, so an interlocutory relief might be can be monetary or it can be an injunction. An injunction, as we know, is an order to do or refrain from doing something. Uh, and Rule 40 from your readings talks about interlocutory injunctions. So uh, so it can be made um, with notice or without notice. Um, we'll see that uh, you know as we know granting any type of order without notice um, is contravenes the audi alterum partum principle and is therefore something which courts do uh, only in the most extraordinary circumstances and even then um, they uh, they're, they're going to um, do so in, a, in only a, a temporary way right so that gives us rule 40.02 an interlocutory injunction or mandatory order may be granted on motion without notice for a period not exceeding 10 days. So if for some exceptional reason they're going to do it, it's not going to last for more than 10 days. And we'll um, see why that's important when we get to the Henko case. Uh, and Rule 40.03, on a motion for an interlocutory injunction, the moving party shall undertake to abide by any by any, uh, sorry, any order concerning damages that the court may make if it ultimately appears the granting of the order has caused damage to the responding party for which the moving party ought to compensate the responding party. Okay, so um, a horrible paragraph as far as English composition goes, uh, but what they're getting at here is that if you're if you're getting an interlocutory injunction, then that means you are asking for a, a substantive order made without the benefit of full evidence, right? So this is a substantive order affecting the real world rights of your adversary, which you're asking the judge to grant without the benefit of a trial, without the benefit of a full evidentiary record, and in the case of a motion without notice, without perhaps even giving the adversary a chance to tell their side of the story. So if you're doing that, there's a bigger chance that the court's going to get it wrong, right? And if they do get it wrong, and if they do incorrectly interfere with the rights of your adversary, then and then you know later on at trial, it emerges that that interlocutory injunction was in fact wrong then you've got to make the, your adversary whole, right? You've got to undertake, which is to say promise, to abide by any order concerning damages that the court may make if it subsequently, with the benefit of better evidence, emerges that that interlocutory relief was wrong, was wrongfully granted. Right, so I, I hope that makes sense. It's like, I mean, it, it, the idea is it takes a long time to get to that final adjudication. Therefore, we've we got to have some provision for giving people substantive relief on an interlocutory basis while we're waiting for that. But it's more likely to be wrong because we're not, we don't have the benefit of a full trial. And therefore, if it is wrong and things turn out differently after the trial, you're going to have to compensate. So undertaking uh, is kind of an important concept. So there's a couple slides on that. Uh, an undertaking, um, uh, it, it, again, refers back to the rules of professional conduct. A lawyer must strictly and scrupulously fulfill any undertakings given by him or her and honor uh, any trust conditions. You don't need to worry about trust conditions right now. But, but the idea here is an undertaking is a lawyer's promise. And, uh, and a lawyer's promise is supposed to be worth more than a non-lawyer's promise. And if you 
um, make that undertaking on behalf of your client, as Rule 40.03 requires you to, uh, then you need to do everything in your power to ensure that that undertaking uh, is, is, is fulfilled. Okay. Um, let's, uh, just before we get to RJR, let's look at one more thing from these, uh, from these rules, which is the circumstances in which um, a, uh, a motion without notice might be granted. Um, so that's, uh, uh, oh, you know what? We'll, we'll leave that for later because because RJR was not uh, was not without notice. Um, for the moment, we'll just say that you know granting any type of motion without notice is something that, you, that would only be done if um, you know there's an exceptional need for it, right? Like typically uh, a well-founded suspicion that the other side destroy evidence or flee the jurisdiction or, or do something like that if you even grant them notice of the fact that you're you're bringing them a motion against them. Okay, so RJR, um, this, uh, this case uh, is about tobacco advertising, right? Which um, many of you may be too young to remember, but uh, up through the 80s, tobacco advertising was ubiquitous in Canada, right? Major sporting events were openly sponsored by tobacco companies. There were billboards, there were TV ads. It was the full marketing uh, um Panoply was available for, for tobacco products. Um, so uh, there were ads, um, uh, like, and, and this was the type of warning that they were talking about, right, in this case. So if you've seen tobacco packaging lately, you'll know this is uh, seems very, very mild uh, compared to kind of you know, the gruesome pictures of diseases and so forth that you see on uh, cigarette packages now. But this is the type of thing that they were arguing about back when this case um, came about. Um, it already, uh, they'd already left the kind of golden age of tobacco advertising uh, from the 50s. Give your throat a vacation, smoke a fresh cigarette. Um, so that was, uh, that. those days were gone, um, but there was still a very active dispute about exactly how far the government could go in restricting uh, restricting tobacco advertising. They were talking about um, uh, these uh, power walls, for example, right, where they, they used to used to be allowed to have right behind the the uh, the, the cash register in the convenience store um, this wall uh, wall of advertising that had the smokes behind it. Um, so that's the kind of thing that they were uh, they were disputing. Okay, so by the 80s, right, the government's uh, starting to crack down on tobacco advertising, um, largely because of concerns about its effect on, uh, on children. Um, and uh, there's this federal legislation. So, uh, so what was the federal, federal, federal legislation? Who can uh, type, um, type in the comments the name of this, uh, the federal legislation which gave rise to this dispute? Bingo, Tobacco Products Control Act. And, um, and specifically, um, the, the regulations uh, under this act pertaining to point of sale advertising, so this is point of sale advertising, uh, and these labels on packages as well. Okay, so, uh, so this is a constitutional case. What, uh, what part of the Constitution was at issue in this case? Uh, yeah, so so primarily this is about the freedom of expression, uh, Section 2B. Uh, corporations have a charter, a charter right to freedom of expression, um, just as individuals do. So this judgment you read is from the Supreme Court of Canada. What, uh, what did the lower courts say about this constitutional argument, the Section 2B argument? So, uh, so the Court of Appeal sided with the feds, right, um, after losing... Uh, after, after the tobacco companies won at the, at the first level. Okay, so this judgment you read, uh, this is not constitutional law, right? So you did not uh, read um, a judgment about the constitutionality of, uh, of tobacco products control legislation. Um, that issue was still to be heard and determined. 
this judgment is about what's going to happen while we're waiting for an adjudication of that constitutional issue. Uh, why don't people take 30 seconds and, and type in the comments where this uh, motion was being adjudicated here fits on our family tree. Okay, great. I think people have pretty much nailed it, right? We're talking about a substantive motion that affects the real world. Uh, this isn't just about who's going to file what, when, or what type of service we're going to have. This is about what these companies really have to do. Uh, and it's interlocutory. This is not a motion which can finish this case. It's simply a motion which can which can determine what's going to happen while we're waiting for a final uh, resolution. Uh, and it's an injunction. Um, it's not about money. It's about uh, what has to be done or not done. And finally, it's on notice, um, as uh, most motions are. Okay, so um, the federal government's position uh, is, look, no one knows what the Supreme Court of Canada is going to say. We don't know how they're going to come down on this. Um, and, you know, the feds say the basic principle is you've got the right to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada and you're exercising that right, tobacco companies. But the Quebec Court of Appeal sided with the federal government. Right? And they say uh, the rule of law, this is the Fed's position, means you have to comply while you're appealing, right? Because that's the, that's the law. The Quebec Court of Appeal has said what the law is uh, pending uh, any, any further appeal. And the rule of law means you have to comply while you're appealing. So make the changes, right? Comply with tobacco products legislation, take down your power walls and so forth. And then if you win, you can put that stuff back up. What do the tobacco companies say? What's, what's their position on this? Because they say um, something very different about what should happen in the meantime while they're waiting for a final adjudication. Yes, that's right. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, can anyone tell us in the comments how much money they say it's going to uh, it's going to cost them to comply with this uh, with this legislation. Thirty mil is exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's a lot of money, um, and uh, they say, uh, you know, look, the, the the Quebec Superior Court agreed with us. One of the judges on the Quebec Court of Appeal agreed with us. Um, you know, no one knows, but there's a pretty darn good chance that this legislation will be found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of Canada. So why should we spend $30 million um, complying with something that might end up being unconstitutional? Um, so RJR says at paragraph 11, um, we don't want to comply with this in the meantime. And they say, even if we lose, right? So even if the Supreme Court finally says we're wrong, we want 12 months to comply, right? Because in, if, if we're not going to do anything to comply before they make the judgment, then we're going to need 12 months after that to actually come into compliance. Okay, so uh, going down to 40, paragraph 41, um, they state uh, what, what the issue is. Uh, whether the applicants should be uh, granted the interlocutory relief that they seek. Um, interlocutory meaning to be excused. They want to be excused from the application of this law in the meantime. Um, okay, so we'll get to the test for these interlocutory injunctions in, in a second. But uh, we need to talk also about the specific constitutional context of this case, right? So this um, RJR, it's here in civil procedure because it's the leading case, the test for all interlocutory injunctions. Uh, but unlike most inter interlocutory injunctions, this one involves constitutional considerations. And the, the court gets into that in, uh, in paragraph 42, um, what, what the charter has to do with, with this stuff. And, and basically they say there's two uh, policy considerations, two competing policy considerations um, at play here. 
On the one hand, courts must be sensitive to and cautious of making rulings which deprive legislation enacted by elected officials of its effect. Right? So a parliamentary majority passed the tobacco products control legislation, and uh, the court, the, the most the highest court to opine on the matter, the Quebec Court of Appeal, has upheld its constitutionality. So we, it's, not a, it's not a small thing to say, to excuse these companies from complying with this presumptively constitutional law. But on the other hand, for the courts to insist rigidly that all legislation be enforced to the letter until the moment that it is struck down as unconstitutional might in some instances be to condone the most blatant violations, violation of charter rights. Right, so, you know, if, uh, if parliament uh, were to pass a law saying uh, it's now a crime to have red hair, right? And anyone with red hair is going to be imprisoned. Um, then, you know, clearly uh, all the redheads would challenge that in court. Uh, but if people, if people were to be imprisoned, uh, if the law were to be fully applied and enforced pending adjudication of that constitutional complaint, then um, lots of people would be deprived of their, charter, of their charter rights on the slenderest of rationales. Right? So it's, it's easy to imagine circumstances in which uh, it would be um, grossly wrong to enforce legislation, unconstitutional legislation, for as long as it takes to have the court strike it down, especially if it's going to have to go up through two or three levels of appeal to get to a final adjudication. So, uh, so, so this is kind of the, the, the policy conundrum they've got, right? And in, in making a judgment about interlocutory, uh, and this not interlocutory injunction, they've got to balance these two, uh, these two considerations, both of which are, are quite compelling. Okay, so, uh, so that um, brings us to the test, right? The RJR uh, McDonald test, which they're going to, which they're going to apply um, to all applications for interlocutory injunctions. First branch of the test, the applicant, so that is to say the person seeking interlocutory relief, must demonstrate that there is a serious question to be tried, right? So it can't be a, a frivolous or vexatious consideration. Uh, the, uh, at paragraph 51, uh, the government is um, saying, uh, look, when there's a judgment below that's on appeal, as is the case here, the Fed say it should be harder to get an injunction, to get an injunction which is contrary to the judgment of a lower court, right? So, so, so you see what's happening here? The government's saying, look, sometimes someone's seeking interlocutory relief and no court has made an order as would be the case with Lacalamita and McCarthy Tetro, if they were seeking interlocutory relief. Whereas here, that's not the case. Here we've had the Quebec Court of Appeal opine on this. So the government says, uh, says we need to distinguish between those two types of cases, whether or not there's, there's a judgment from a lower court. Uh, the court here says that might be true for private cases, but that's not the case for charter cases, right? So when we're talking about the charter, these charter rights are so important that every court has to review the matter carefully, no matter what um, any lower court might have said. Um, okay, so, so this, this branch is a low threshold, right? Um, we don't, when someone's asking for interlocutory relief, if the court were to engage in extensive review of the merits of the case, then that would kind of defeat the point because, because the, the full review of the merits is supposed to be what happens at trial. Uh, here we're just trying to get a sense of whether there is a serious question um, to, to be tried. Uh, unless, we're at paragraph 56 here, there are certain circumstances in which at the interlocutory stage we might have to engage in an extensive review of the merits of the case. Right? One of these is if Paragraph 56, the result of the interlocutory motion will in effect 
amounts to a final determination of the action. So uh, this will be the case either when the right which the applicant seeks to protect can only be exercised immediately or when the result of the application will impose such hardship on one party as to remove any potential benefit from proceeding to trial. Okay, so we're getting kind of deep in the, in, in the weeds here, but can anyone explain this for us? Like what, what, what or, or tell us, explain what examples are used of circumstances in which uh, we have to, at the interlocutory stage, engage in a full consideration of the merits. Why might it be that this would, this would apply? Yes, yes, excellent. I'm glad you raised that. Uh, because this, of course, just um, just came out today, right? So, you know, not the biggest political news of the day, but it was uh, part of the political news of the day uh, that um, uh, the government's um, legislation whereby the size of Toronto City Council was cut in half uh, was not unconstitutional, according to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and as Andrew said, um, this was this case involved an application for interlocutory relief, right? So the, the final Ontario Court of Appeal judgment was today, uh, but this judgment here um, came out uh, on September 18th, right? So what happened there? Um, the uh, the the this legislation was introduced to reduce the size of city council. Um, the respondents, um, the the objectors. Uh, um, Rocco and the city of Toronto uh, said, look, um, you know, it's all well and good to, you know, fight this out at the Ontario Court of Appeal and, you know, have a couple of months to have everything properly heard. But the election is um, going to be in a couple of weeks. Right. So uh, so we need interlocutory relief. If this legislation is unconstitutional and outside the power of the provincial government, then we need that relief right now. That the, 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 the effect of this legislation needs to be stayed so that we can have the election under the old rules with the larger, uh, the larger council. So this case was fought on the basis of, uh, of, RJ, of the RJR McDonald case, right? And um, th this case is not assigned and not examinable. Uh, but just to say that when what the parties are fighting over is something that really can't wait, um, and has to be resolved now or not resolved at all, uh, that, um, that, that may play into the uh, level of scrutiny, right? So w the court is going to need to fully consider the merits if it's not going to have a chance to do that later because the whole issue will be irrelevant. Not the case here, right? So here we're talking about uh, tobacco control. There's no reason in principle why we can't take a few months and, and get it right. Therefore, uh, the, we're only going to apply minimal scrutiny to, uh, to this first branch of the test here at the interlocutory stage. Okay, so um, there's also uh, a, a, a paragraph 60. They say we also might get into a more a full con consideration of the merits if the question of unconstitutionality presents itself as a simple question of law alone, right? So uh, in the rare case where there's no real factual dispute and it's a purely a question of, of law, then we might be able to fully consider and dispose of that question of law at the interlocutory stage. Um, so in that case, again, we, we might we might do that. But otherwise, in the normal case where there's factual disputes to adjudicate and um, and, and we realistically can take a few months to, to consider it fully, we are not going to consider it fully at this interlocutory relief stage. Okay, on to branch number two. Uh, the applicant, the, the party seeking interlocutory relief, must also demonstrate irreparable harm, that they will suffer irreparable harm if that interlocutory relief is not granted. So irreparable, they say, is about the nature of the harm, not the quantity of the harm. 
So if there's no irreparable harm, like if you won't be permanently injured in a, in a manner which the court cannot possibly repair while you're waiting for the final adjudication, then you're just going to have to wait for the final adjudication. So on these facts, the question is, you know, if, if we deny interlocutory relief to the tobacco companies and we say, look, guys, you're going to have to abide by the Quebec Court of Appeal ruling in the meantime while we're waiting for a final adjudication, will your interest be so badly damaged that there's no way the final judgment can make you whole? Because the final judgment, right, if, uh, you know, th th there's ways that the final judgment can uh, can make you whole for what you've lost um, while you were waiting for it. So uh, so we know about the cost of the cost awards, right? Cost shifting means that if you had to go to trial, um, the court is going and you win. The court's going to give you something extra to compensate you for what you had to pay your lawyer to get there. There's also prejudgment interest, whereby if you're found to be owed money by the by the defendant then not only will they have to pay you what they owed you but they'll also have to pay you interest to reflect the fact that you did not have the benefit of that money while you were waiting for trial those are both ways that the final judgment can make a party whole for uh for the fact that they had to wait for their justice irreparable harm is what we have when that cannot be done right if waiting for final adjudication Something will happen while you're waiting, which cannot be repaired by that by that final judgment. Um, so, uh, so he, who can give us an example of uh, of irreparable harm, of a situation where a party will will experience irreparable harm waiting for the judgment that they, they can't be fixed. At after the trial, absolutely, that's right. If they're going to go bankrupt. That's that's irreparable harm. That's one example. Invasion of privacy um, is something that it, it's thought that money can compensate that. Um, but if it were your liberty, uh, or certainly if it were your life, or if it you know were your bodily integrity, like you're for some reason you're going to lose your leg um, if uh, if you don't get this then that's the sort of thing that might be it might be irreparable harm okay so um right so paragraph 65 uh, to 66 they talk about how this branch of the rjr mcdonald test uh, plays out in charter cases and how it might be a bit different in charter cases most non-charter cases are about money whereas most charter cases are not about money right which means that in a charter case, um, it's easier for the applicant to pass this branch of the test, right? Because if you know state action is depriving you of your charter rights, depriving you of your liberty, depriving you of your you know your right to practice your religion, um, that is the sort of thing which is harder to repair with a money money award. So it's not that it's not a free pass in charter cases, but it's uh, this is a lower bar there because the nature of charter rights is such that it's harder to uh, repair breaches through money. Okay, um, on to branch three of the test, uh, the balance of inconvenience. So this, um, as you probably know by this deep into law school, when there's a three-part test, branch three is usually the part where the action typically is uh, and the balance of inconvenience is about who is going to be put out more who's going to be prejudiced more if the interlocutory decision is overturned by the final decision right so when you're seeking interlocutory relief your tip the, the court's typically going to have to opine on uh the same issues that uh, um that it will at the final adjudication right uh and it's going to do so with um so if, if we get it wrong right if if what we say at the interlocutory stage uh we overturn it at the final judgment um who is going to which side is going to be more prejudiced if uh, if if that happens 
Um, so, so the idea here is that if uh, you know one side is saying um, it, it, if 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 we side with them and then we get it wrong, maybe that won't put them out very much at all. Um, whereas for the other side, if if that's the case, that would that would do very serious, create very serious inconvenience for them. Um, okay, so uh, so that's on uh, on the table here. That's always going to be relevant when we're talking about interlocutory injunctions. In charter cases, we're also talking about the public interest. Right, because charter cases are not just about the party's private interest, they're also about the public interest in ensuring that uh, the state is bound by the charter. Um, and, and, and the public interest, of course, in, ha in allowing the state to legislate up to the, 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 the bounds of, of the charter. So in charter cases, the third branch and the, the public interest considerations will will often get at some really kind of basic values about government, right? Because if you if you believe that the government is basically benevolent and the government is, is typically going to be sort of, you know, passing legislation in the public interest to constrain a private interest, then you're going to be skeptical about interlocutory relief in charter cases, right? So if you if you're fundamentally um, open to state intervention in, in private affairs, then you're going to be skeptical about, about people saying that we should be excused from, uh, for, from legislation on charter grounds at the interlocutory level. On the other hand, if you come from more of a libertarian point of view, um, you might say, you know, freedom from government is of prime importance. And uh, the state has to prove that its impositions on our liberty are, are constitutional. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a point where like civil litigation touches on some kind of deep philosophic differences of opinion about the role of government and you know, who, should be, who should bear the onus when we're talking about uh, people being excused from the application of legislation on charter grounds. Okay, so what does the court say about this? Paragraph 70, the government does not have a monopoly on the public interest, right? So private litigants like RJR uh, can, uh, can also make public interest arguments under branch three of the test. Um, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, the particular interests of identifiable groups like tobacco companies are also part of the public interest. Uh, and, you know, RJR might say, you know, this isn't just about us and our, our $30 million expense we'd have to pay for this. This is also about, uh, about you know, the, the convenience store owners, right? They too, um, you, you know, you're asking them too to take down all of their displays. Uh, and that's a big um, uh, inconvenience to them if this legislation is ultimately found to be unconstitutional. So, uh, so, so the private litigant can also say that uh, that you know the, the balance of convenience um, should should be in our favor. Um, but at paragraph seventy six, um, the court is saying that the, the, in a charter case, the government kind of um, has uh, ha will we'll, we'll track some judicial deference when it comes to the balance of inconvenience, right? That uh, when the government is enacts legislation, there's sort of a presumption that it's in the public interest. We have enough faith in our uh, legislatures and in our parliament that um, presumptively we're going to assume they're trying to do something which is in the public interest uh, until this go, goes the other way. So, uh, so for that reason, um, in a charter case, uh, you know, typically the government gets a bit of deference on this third branch of the test. Okay, so that's our test. Um, we'll just quickly see how it applies to the facts. Uh, the serious question to be, um, uh, which paragraph was it? That was uh, paragraph 76. Um, so the serious question to be tried, um, the uh, RJR passes, right? Clearly this is a, there's a serious question. I mean, if nothing else, the fact that lower courts disagreed about the constitutionality of this legislation would establish that serious question to be tried. Um, irreparable harm 
Um, here again, RJR succeeds, right? Because even though it might look like the only thing they have to do is spend the money and you know the court could, could order that that 30 million be paid back afterwards, um, in fact, um, it's, uh, it's a charter case. And so, uh, so the, um, and Jeremy, I'll get to your question in a second. Uh, it, when it's a charter case, the, um, the irreparable harm, having your freedom of expression um, unconstitutionally infringed upon is, uh, is going to be irreparable harm, even though it's a corporation. Um, and finally, the balance of inconvenience, right? So they talk about how much expenditure it is, um, the economic hardship on the companies uh, involved with taking all the stuff down if it turns out to be unconstitutional after all. Um, but they're large and very successful corporations. Some of this $30 million, uh, because it's going to um, affect every tobacco company, um, it doesn't put any one of them at a particular competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the other tobacco companies. So they can probably all pass the costs along in increased prices of cigarettes. Uh, which diminishes the uh, the inconvenience it faces, uh, it subjects they're subjected to. Um, and there are clear indications, paragraph 96, that the government passed the regulations with the intention of protecting public health and thereby furthering the public good. Um, so that also uh, that also tells against the uh, against the tobacco companies, right? So the public interest consideration really the court is more sympathetic to the government here. The only, this is paragraph 98, the only possible public interest argument on the side of the tobacco companies is that of smokers not having the price of a package of cigarettes increase, um, which is not likely to be very big and it's, it's purely economic. In conclusion, paragraph 99, the balance of inconvenience weighs strongly in favor of the respondent, the federal government, and is not offset by the irreparable harm that the applicants may suffer if the relief is denied, um, therefore the application is dismissed. Uh, and the companies have to comply with this law pending the final determination regarding its constitutionality. Okay, so the takeaway here is that this test is applicable to all um, interlocutory injunctions, right? Charter or otherwise. Uh, we talked about the charter considerations to kind of, and they kind of may change how some of these things play out. Um, but RJR is the leading case for all such injunctions. And, and basically, if you um, apply this test, then, then you're going to be fine. Um, and you know, the, w what's relevant will depend on the nature of the, of the legal issue at stake and the facts, uh, but it's the universal, universal test. How is the government inconvenienced by granting them relief until a final ruling. Uh, so um, that's what the court's trying to get at um, in paragraph um, 95 and, and, and thereafter, right? So, so there's this public interest argument. Um, and you could say, and I, I, I might agree with you, that um, there's not that much inconvenience. I guess, you know, the inconvenience ultimately is that, uh, you know, by getting this exemption, um, they can go on pushing these lethal tobacco products on uh, on on kids for another couple months or another year, perhaps even, and that will result in more people getting lung cancer than would otherwise be the case. Um, you know, I, I would agree that the, the the judgment is not that clear on exactly what the inconvenience is, but they do clearly identify with this public interest motive that that they see underlying the government's action, which comes down to protecting public health.